meet people I don't know. My new friend, Santa, my friend. I told her I'd try not to scare her out of here today. It's her first time. I didn't try that hard. I'm sorry. Well, praise God. It is good to be here today. I don't know if it's right to say, but I'm glad when Rocco's not here. I, I really enjoy it. Because I get to do worship. I enjoy it. I mean, I love my brother. I love what he does too, but. At least he gives a chance for an old dog like me to try. So, how's everybody? Good. Here we go. We're back in the book of Luke, and Jesus is going to explain to us in three different ways what humility looks like. Now, I don't know if it's something you find in the mirror, but it's something that Jesus describes to us extremely well. And as we look at these three scenarios... Jesus is actually going to have conflict in two of them, and one of them is a story. And he tells us exactly why he tells the story, which is helpful because I don't have to pretend to know what he's saying because he just tells us. Every time we approach the scriptures, it's always a wonderful thing. So let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are who you are and that you have called us to be your children not just your creations, but your children. I thank you, Lord, that you opened our eyes that at some point in our lives that you revealed yourself to us that Jesus is the son of the living God and that we are broken beyond repair and our only hope is in Jesus. Lord God, I thank you for the sacrifice that you sent, the ridiculous, reckless, crazy love that you had for us. And Lord, as we look into your word, I pray that you would help each one of our hearts to be plowed up by the worship that would be sensitized by your spirit, that you would help us, that your word like a seed would go deep into our souls and that it might change us, that we might become more like you. Help us to see you afresh today in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So, as you know, we've been in the book of Luke. We're picking it up in chapter 18. Of course, of course, last week we went through some of it. We're going to see two men who go to the temple to pray. We're going to see Jesus talking about children. Uh, maybe not the way you talk about your children, but he's going to talk about children. And then there's the parable of the rich young ruler. So, we're going to look at some familiar passages. And the difficulty is, for some of it's familiar and you just go, oh, I'll, I'll check on what's going on in the Ukraine, pull up my phone, because you figure you know it all. The beautiful thing about the Word of God is it can be fresh every single time you look at it. And we certainly need reminding. Amen? Amen. Okay, I'm not the only one. Good. Let's see if this works. It does. Oh, almost works. All kind of works. Okay, there it goes. Goodbye. Last week, we were talking about the coming kingdom part two, because I couldn't finish it in one setting. It says here, he spoke a parable that men ought to always pray and not lose heart. And he begins to tell a story about a judge who didn't care about people. It was an unjust judge in a certain city that did not fear God or man. And I picked Judge Judy because she kind of epitomizes the picture I have in my mind. No love for God, no love for other people. The two main things Jesus said we're supposed to do. There was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice from me for my adversary, but she would not for a while. And then Judge Judy Stiles said, no, I'm not going to do it. Afterwards, he said within himself, Though I don't fear God or regard men, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming, she weary me, like I don't want anything to do with this woman, she's wearing me out, she's nagged me death. And so the judge does the right thing for the wrong reason. Doesn't have a character to care about this widow. I mean, she's a female. In this day and age, they had absolutely no rights in court. 
And she was a widow, and so she had no one to speak for her. She had no man providing for her, and it was probably about property. So she was kind of at a deficit, and now she's before a judge who doesn't give a rip. Unfortunately, that's the way we think of God when we pray. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Jesus asks the question, will he really find, and in the original language, it is the article, the faith. When the Son of Man comes, will he find the faith on the earth? And he raises the question as to whether there'll be anybody who's actually looking for his coming or believes that God is a gracious, loving God who we have access to 24-7. You don't have to check out on the internet and see if he's closed. He's open all the time to hear our prayers and he cares. So we got through eight verses in light speed. That was last week. We're going to see two men pray. We're going to see Jesus and children and a rich young ruler who comes to Jesus. Jesus also spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. I love when it begins with the explanation of why Jesus is going to say what he's going to say, because it helps my antenna to go up. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So Jesus telling us a true story. It's an interesting thing. He spoke the parable about those who trusted in themselves and who, that they were righteous and they despised everyone else. Who do you think he's speaking to? The Pharisees. Because he uses a Pharisee as the bad guy in the story, right? That's who he's speaking to. The religious, the righteous. Those who feel that their righteousness is so much, I am so much better than you people. Sort of mentality. You know who gets accused of having this attitude more than anyone else? Christians. Christians. So I think it's a good lesson for us. In Proverbs chapter 6, it says, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven that are abomination to him. Number one is a proud look. The pride of man or woman. I'll be generous. <laughs> pride. The world orbits me. My life is about me. It's about my comfort. It's about what I have. It's about what I do. When I have a conversation with you, I don't even know your name, but I have to tell you everything that's awesome about me. That's pride. You, you can really dislocate your shoulder by patting yourself on the back. You know that. And you might know somebody like this who you know they just gonna, they're going to take all the air out of the room talking to you about all of their great adventures and where they've been and what they've seen and how good they are and, and oh, those people. The number one thing that God hates on his list is a proud look, which is why phone calls and text messages aren't really a good solid communication base, is it? Because you don't see facial expressions. You don't get to see in somebody's eyes what they're saying. And so sometimes it can be contrived to mean something that it really doesn't mean. Jesus says it's a proud look. And you've seen this look as people kind of look down their noses at you. It's kind of a term 
uh, that's not all. We have lots of people who look down their nose at other people, and I'll go across the aisle and make sure we include everyone <laughs> with, the private, with the prideful look. God hates it because it comes from a prideful heart. It comes from a heart where you think you are more righteous than other people. You think that you're better than somebody else. And that's why Jesus is telling this parable. And so you can look down your nose at people and give them that air, that attitude that you're something when you know that you're nothing. And it's usually an attempt on people's behalf to kind of soothe their own brokenness, to cover their own shatteredness, their own insecurities. And so they put on a brave face, so to speak. The proud look, the first thing that God hates. So if I ever give you one of those looks, call me on it. Because I don't want to be like this guy. And, and I don't want to look like this. So a proud look when you think that you're better than everyone else and you can do whatever it is that you want, that the rules apply to everyone else but you. Okay. I know it's slightly irreverent, but you get it, right? And I think any middle-aged man should never be seen without a shirt on. <laughs> Me especially. Verse 10. Jesus tells the story. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Tax collectors were Jews who sold themselves to the Roman government to collect money from their own people and were notorious for being underhanded. Even worse than a politician because they robbed you personally. And they would have Romans escort them around and make sure that they were protected. It's interesting, Matthew was one of these, a disciple of Jesus Christ, whom he was called. And a Pharisee, the most strict sect of the religious right in Judaism. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Notice he didn't pray to God. It's him and him alone because he's talking to God about himself. Probably orders Self Magazine. It's all about him. He's not praying to God. He's using this as an opportunity to tell anyone within earshot how good he is. And God's not listening because he's praying by himself. God's not even involved. Isn't that interesting? They used to go on the street corners and they used to lift their hands and they'd say prayers out loud. They would go on street corners where all the people were. They would disfigure their faces so that people would understand that they were fasting. And they'd say, hey, are you okay? Yeah, I'm just fasting today. It was a show. Everything they did was for a show. It wasn't for God, because Jesus said, if, if you're going to do that, wash your face, make sure you look good, smile, get this stuff out of your teeth, and, and look happy. And don't let anybody ask you, hey, what's wrong with you? Let it be a secret, and your heavenly Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Don't sound a trumpet like the hypocrites do when you give. You know, don't, don't get a wing named after you on, on a hospital. Just Give them the money and let it be a secret. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing, Jesus says, because it's not about you. And we have to remember that. He stood and prayed with himself. And he says, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this guy. Can you imagine? this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. I want you to notice, I thank God that I am not like other men, like this guy. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. He's got a couple of mistakes here. Number one, I thank you I'm not like other men. Guess what? You are other than your pride, and it might be unusually high, you are exactly like other men. There is no man on the face of this planet, no woman on the face of this planet, that is any different as we stand before God because we are all sinners. All have fallen short and fall short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. 
we miss the mark. We're broken, we're twisted, and without a savior, we're lost for eternity in, you know, H-E double hockey sticks. I'm glad I'm not like this guy. Notice the Pharisees standing. You know, posture has a lot to do with what's going on in your heart. You know, when you see somebody standing like this, you, you get it, you know. When you see somebody standing like this, they're posing for an Avengers photo or something. <laughs> you can tell a lot by posture, certainly the proud look you, you can tell, but also posture. This guy's standing, which tells me he feels like he has a right to stand before God and proclaim all these boastful things. He prayed with himself. And he said, I'm not like other men, which is a complete lie. He's exactly like other men, pretending that he's not. Don't let anybody tell you that they don't ever struggle with sin in their mind, in their heart, in their life. Because it's just not true. Jesus made that very clear. Comparing to the worst of other men is not wise. You know, compared to some people, I'm thin. and young, okay? Because it all depends on who you're gonna compare yourself to. And this is a psychological thing that we do. We find people that are worse than us so we can look down on them so we feel better about ourselves. You know, I find somebody with a ratty car that's barely running and I say, yeah, I got a better car than that. Until a Maserati goes by and I go. <laughs> But that's what we do. And it's an attempt to fill a space that isn't supposed to be filled with that stuff. Our satisfaction, the true yearning of every soul on the planet is to be in relationship with God and to not fear death. Something we're all going to face. Comparing ourselves to the worst is not wise. He says this, I fast twice a week. That tells me he's a religious guy. And it tells me he goes over what a Pharisee is supposed to do. Actually, there was only one time, and it's mentioned in Leviticus, when you're supposed to fast as a Jew. <coughs> Passover. Dave, or Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. One day. That's it. He does it twice a week. Oh. Then why are you so big? He fasts twice a week and he gives tithes of all that I possess. Notice the I possess. It's my stuff. You know what? You don't have any stuff. You don't have any stuff. We speak of it that way, but it's not. My car is really the Lord's car, so when it breaks down, it's not my problem. <laughs> and often I've prayed and say, Lord, the woman that you gave me. Oh. <laughs> you think I'm afraid? I'm afraid of Judy. <laughs> I am afraid of Draculia. I give tithes of all that I possess, and none of us possesses anything, do we? Everything is a gift from, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights in whom there is no shadow of turning. God gives us all things, our ability to think, our ability to speak, our ability to stand, our ability to walk relatively, sturdy, all of what we have, our relative youth, all of it is from the Lord God himself through Jesus Christ. And we should have a thankful heart for such a thing. And remember, Jesus is saying this for those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. You see, to lift yourself up and inflate yourself to a place where you don't belong means that you automatically are going to downgrade other people because you have to. It's the only way you're going to feel better about yourself. And you have to find somebody that you can compare yourself that you look better. It's sad, but we do it. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. He wouldn't raise his eyes to heaven and he stood afar off. That tells me something, doesn't it? He was humble. He was, humble. He was worried about his, 
his heart coming before God. And he knew he was a sinner. He knew he was broken. He knew he needed a savior. He needs a sacrifice. He needs someone to take the rap for him, or he's going to stand before a God who is holy and perfect in every way and have to give an account for all the things that he's done. He stands afar off because he has absolutely no right to talk to God, to come to him. You know, say, hey, Jesus is my buddy, me and him. That's God's son, God's only son. That's God the son. He's so much more than your buddy. He stood afar off. He would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. That tells me of a humility of heart. He doesn't have a proud look. We don't have to worry that he's on God's number one I hate list. He beat his breast, and it means that he constantly beat, he literally was beating himself up. He felt he deserved it. So stupid. Why did I, I keep doing the wrong thing and I, I can't seem to stop. I, God, I'm a miserable failure. Help me. You know, that's a prayer God hears. Amen. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other men, those who cannot inflict their voice, those without a microphone. <laughs> he constantly beat his breast because he had a real sense of his own unworthiness talking to God. That's how we approach God, boys and girls. Jesus was asked, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he says, pray in this manner. He didn't say pray these exact words, but he said, pray in this manner. Here's, here's, the, here's some of the topics you need to cover. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, holy, so far above me that I can't even reach further than the heavens, is your name. That's how we approach God initially. And he's our Father. Isn't that cool? He's not mine. He's my father. I don't know where you're coming from. No, he's our father. He beat his breast continually. And he said, be merciful to me, a sinner. He had a real sense of who he was as he stood before God. Instead of chatting it up like he would a buddy. In Isaiah 66, it says this, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? As though we could do anything for God, right? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one, I will look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. This is the one that God sees. This is the God who hears when we tremble at his word. When we come before God's word with a reverence and an understanding that this is God's book, God's plan. And we come to it and we submit our hearts. In Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, the question is asked by David, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? Which is what the sky's doing. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands, it means you're innocent of any wrongdoing. And a pure heart, meaning your imagination is completely wholesome. Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol. When we place anything before God, it becomes an idol. Nor sworn deceitfully or acted um, Tell somebody that's not something exactly true. That's the one that can go before the presence of God, which suddenly disqualifies everyone except Jesus Christ, the only one who was good, was able to approach the Father. He came from the Father, returned to the Father, and he came to sacrifice his life so that we might have a relationship with him. He's the one who cleans our hands, who purifies our heart and our imaginations. He's the one who unlearns us all of the things that we've been brought up with and all of the brokenness that we carry to him. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide, like we say. He's ready to take us and repair us. Amen? Amen. I'm glad for that. Jesus says of the man who humbled himself, beat his breast, stood afar off, and said, forgive me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, 
and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Justified is just as if I'd never sinned. That's what it is to be justified. The only person that will be justified as we come before God is the one who's accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. The one who has accepted the forgiveness that was purchased by the very life of God the Son. That's the only way. And I will be justified as I confess that and agree with him. That's what confession is. It's homo legeo. It's say the same words. That means I agree with God. I said I wasn't going to speak another language, and I did. I'm sorry. You know why God punished Sodom? A trivia question right in the middle of the message. Yes. Do you know what Sodom's problem was? Of course, we, we know what's said, and, and we hi there are certain things that are highlighted in our mind. This is what it says in Ezekiel chapter 16. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter, by the way, that's Gomorrah, speaking of city, cities as two sisters, had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. There were three things wrong with Sodom. Pride, first thing. Second thing, they were full of food. They were satisfied. They had no want. They had no desire. Why should I go to work? I'll get a check. And idleness. Why? Because they had enough of everything. What, why, what inspires you to go work if you have everything you need? And so what they do at that time? Wasted it. Full of food, abundance of idleness, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Because, of course, when your life is focused on yourself, you don't care about anybody else. And they were haughty, which is prideful, and committed abomination before me. That's why they were all homosexuals. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. They were self-centered, self-satisfied, and lots of me time. Got to have a lot of me time. And that's why they ended up where they were, because they had absolutely no need to have to work, to slave. They had no purpose. They had nothing other than just self. That is a dangerous place to be. I hear lots of people, I can't wait till I retire. I mean, I'm putting a lot of money aside. I'm hoping, you know, I got some investments and it's going to come back as long as Putin doesn't invade America. And... Then I could take it easy. I could relax. I could put my feet up and have a heart attack. <laughs> if you were speaking the truth, that might be true. It is, it is one of the statistics that as people retire and they suddenly have no more purpose in life, that their desire to live goes away. Because if you have everything that you want and everything that you need and you're taken care of, why are you taking up space? Why are you using up valuable resources? Why not pass them on to somebody else who could use them? These thoughts go through the mind. Not my mind. Because I still have to teach you people a lot of the Bible. I'm going very slow. So I'll stick around. Because I think there's a certain amount of things I need to do before I die. And as long as I go slow, I won't finish them all soon. <laughs> That's... Scenario number one that Jesus tells us. Now, the next two stories actually were true that happened. Then they also brought infants to him that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, he's talking to his disciples, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Well, that's a little scary. Jesus says you have to come to him like a little child, as a little child does. And there are a lot of people that talk about the faith of a child, and I think that's one element of it, but there's nowhere where Jesus ascribes faith necessarily. But there's, you have to come to Jesus like a child. You guys are all sitting here learning, right? That takes a certain amount of submission to a wild man on the stage. But you believe God is in it. And this is his word. So why did they bring the children to Jesus? 
Well, that's a good question. He's not like a politician running for office, you know, where he's going to kiss babies and get pictures taken, right? It's not a picture. It's not a photo op. I don't know. I kind of like kids, but it says here in Matthew 19, 13, Matthew gives us a slightly different bit of information. He says the little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked them. So we get to see what the purpose was for the parents bringing the children to Jesus. Would you pray for my child? They may have been sick or they, they might like a good mom want their kids to be safe and protected. And so get Jesus to lay hands on him. He heals the sick, lepers. He squares everything away. I need to get my kid to Jesus. You know, that's a really good philosophy. Get your kids to Jesus. So he puts his hands on them to pray, but the disciples tell them to go away. So why did disciples act like this? Well, they were a little bit like secret service agents, you know, with sunglasses and, and the little thing in their ear. And, you know, stay away from the teacher. Stand back. We're, yeah, I'm one of the 12. That's right. Get back. And here are these parents bringing little babies. Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Teacher's busy. He's got stuff to do. Don't bother him. With the, <laughs> you bring him a kid. He might vomit on him. Then what? We don't have a change of clothes or anything. That, Forget it. No, no. Stay back. More. Five feet. Zzz, you know, you, that's their mentality. I wonder how many people do that by their behavior, keep people from coming to Jesus. I hope it's not me. So I think they were just trying to protect him. But it's interesting how Jesus reacts. In Mark 10... 13 to 16, it says, then they brought little children to him that he might touch them, but his disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased. Jesus was greatly displeased with his disciples. You know, this is the only time the scripture says that. It's the only time that Jesus was displeased with Pharisees and the hypocrites all the time. He never copped an attitude with his disciples until this happened. And it's the only event where Jesus was perturbed, angry, miffed, rubbed the wrong way, was displeased with them. So I just think of angry Jesus, you know, going into the temple, overturning tables and this kind of thing. Uh, if I traveled with Jesus and I saw the things that he did and I understood who he was, I would not feel comfortable when he was mad. Do you know what I mean? I, that's just me. But, you know, you get angry Jesus, and uh, I'm sure he didn't yell, and I'm sure he didn't scream, because there are kids there, and Jesus is conscious of that. But I think he was angry. I don't think he pulled out a lightsaber. I don't think he did that. But I think it was like this. It's the best angry Jesus look at his disciples that I could think of. Like, don't do that. That's... Essentially, it's the Jersey version. That's what he says. Don't do that. Because if you're not like one of these little children, you're not going to make it to heaven. You will by no means enter it. I don't know about you, but I really like kids. And I think they're absolutely awesome. These are two of mine. My grandchildren, not my kids, you know, too old. Those are my grandkids. Yes, I, I hear the heartstrings of the women. <laughs> Video game, completely. <laughs> and the 11 year old. That's, those are our grandkids. I hope if you ever see them, that you will bring them to Jesus. I hope if you get an opportunity to love on them or stop them from destroying something, that you will do it because you want them to come to Jesus. I imagine you feel that way about your own kids and perhaps your grandkids. Pray for them. Be a good example. Spend time with them. Third picture is the rich young ruler. Jesus actually runs into this guy. It's not a story, it really happens. Now a certain ruler came and asked him saying, 
Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, that's a question that I think a lot of people ask, right? What do you got to do to get to heaven? You ready to answer that question? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, but one that is God. It's interesting because God, the son was standing right there asking him, Hey, you call me good. Are you uh, trying to say something? But there's only one who's good and that's God alone. And the Jews understood this. And so he comes with this probably designed to be like a, Hey, how you doing? When you don't really mean, how are you doing? I, I'd like an answer. It just means it's a greeting. It's a, a greeting that you don't expect somebody to answer. He's just being kind. But Jesus takes him at his word and he says, wait a minute, are you saying what I think you're saying? Because there's only one who's good. Jesus is going to show why he says that in just a minute. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Do any of you know what you have to do? It's a good idea. What is it I have to do? What is it I need to add to my life? Essentially, that's what he's asking. You know, I got, I got a lot of things going on, Jesus. What's the main ingredient? You know, just like a little bit of spice in my life that I, I could add that would make me cross the finish line ahead of everyone else. Because after all, Jesus is now trying to explain why people shouldn't feel self-righteous and look down on other people. He asks, why do you call me good when only God is good? These are good questions. This man shows only a partial understanding of who Jesus is and the requirement for salvation. You know what the requirement to enter heaven is? Perfection. God doesn't want you to ruin the neighborhood. You have to be perfect. Well, there's no one perfect but God. That's right. So how are you going to work that out? Is there anything you can do to undo the wrong you've done? No. You could go to prison and make big rocks into little rocks. You could have an imaginary place called purgatory where you work off your sin, but you can't work off your sin. The only covering for your sin is the blood of God's only son. And that is what takes away our sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And Jesus responds to him on his question. He says, well, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he stops. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. I'm a good boy. Wait, there's only one who's good. This guy's boasting about what a good boy he is. It's interesting. These are the Ten Commandments. You probably recognize them. Uh, you can't read Hebrew. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. How about this guy? You got, you got Moses. Cecil B. DeMille's version of it anyway. He goes up and he gets the Ten Commandments from God. The first table of the law was about how we treat God, and the other half is about how we treat other people. So it begins, I'll put it down in English for you, in, in the abridged version. One is about God. Have no other gods before me. God is to be God. In the place in your heart, in, in your conversation, and where you go, what you do, God is to be first in everything in your life. Above your family, above your spouse, above your money, above your job, above your health, above everything, your safety, your comfort, whatever. God is to be first. Number two, Idols. You're not to have anything in place of God. You're not supposed to fashion anything that looks like an animal or some creeping thing and bow down and worship it. It's not that you're not supposed to have a graven image. Now, some people think if you get your picture taken, oh, there's a graven image. That's not a graven image because you don't bow down and worship it. Now, if it was your picture and you put it on the wall and you bow down and worshiped it, then it's a graven image. So he says, don't make any graven images and bow down and worship them. Number three, my name is holy, so don't take my name in vain. In other words, don't throw the name of God around like a piece of cheese, like it's no big deal. That's what it means. It doesn't mean you don't, you don't say like, you know, some people do in a curse word, use the name Jesus. But although that's vain too, isn't it? It's empty because it's void of purpose or, or meaning. 
It means don't say, you know, God told me I should smack you. Well, there are a lot of prophets who actually said stuff like that. And he goes, don't ever do that. Don't say that I said something if I didn't say something. So don't take it in vain. Number three, the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Because six days the Lord created everything. On the seventh day he rested. Therefore he left an example for us. Not that he was tired. Number five, honor your, your mother and father. Right? That doesn't mean obey. Now when you're a child under their roof, you obey. When you become an adult, you better not be saying, okay, mommy. You should honor them, but not obey them. You should obey God first. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. By the way, you might have some old version that says, thou shalt not kill. That doesn't mean that. You can kill people. Pastor Dave, are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. It doesn't mean don't kill because there were lots of killings that went on. And there are a lot of people that should be killed. In fact, the scripture says anybody who's guilty of murder, they forfeit their life. That's when you take somebody's life, you kill them. But you're not murdering them. Murdering is when you take somebody's life for some personal thing they did to you and you're going to take it into your own hands. God says, don't do that. You got to leave room for me too because God wants to take care of things. You should not commit adultery. That's any sexual contact with somebody that is outside the bounds of your marriage covenant. And if you're not married, that includes you. That's what adultery is. It's not just sleeping with a married woman, because if you sleep with a single woman, well, I escaped. That's a loophole. No. It's any sexual contact outside the, bo the bounds of a covenant marriage. Thou shalt not steal. You don't take things that aren't yours. Pencils, pens, erasers, sticky notes, you don't take things that aren't yours. That makes sense. Because when you get stuff of yours stolen, how do you like it? You don't like it. So don't steal. <laughs> Lying. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Those are, hey, I, I saw him take your lawnmower, but you were the one who took it. Now it's stealing and bearing false witness. <laughs> I, I just, these things come to mind. I don't know where they come. I, I perhaps have done it. Anyway, lying. <laughs> don't lie. And number 10, don't covet. Don't desire anything of anyone else's. So you see a nice car go by, you go, oh, look at that. Don't do that. Because the next thing you know, you're trying to jump the guy's ride. Don't look at a woman and say, oh, I wish you were mine. Because that leads to adultery. Don't, don't look at somebody, something of your neighbors and say, oh, because it might lead to stealing. Don't do it. Notice Jesus gives the rich young ruler the easy ones. He gives him five easy ones. Don't murder. You ask somebody, hey, you going to heaven? They say, oh yeah, I'm going to heaven. How come? Well, I, I never killed anybody. Have you ever heard that? I got that from a whole bunch of people. You never killed anybody, huh? Hmm, that's great. Neither did Hitler. Unless you count his suicide. But... Coveting, murder, all of these things. Jesus makes it easy on this guy. He could have gone to number 10 and he would have been disqualified. And he, ew, 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 and he would have been out. That's the end of the game. But he didn't do it. You think Jesus is going to get on this guy because he says, listen, I've done all this stuff. I, I've done the Ten Commandments. I am a perfect example of what it is to do everything God expects me to do. I, if it were me, I'd snap into angry Jesus mode and tell him what's going on. But Jesus doesn't. It says here in Mark 10, Mark gives us a slightly different take on the same incident. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. That was Jesus' motive for what he's about to say. And he said to him, one thing you lack. Oh, good. One, just one thing? This is going to be easy. It's like, okay, it's test day. Okay, I just have one question. Oh, that's easy. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. Uh, Jesus, I thought you said just one thing. <laughs> Jesus said, that's what you need to do. If you're going to get there on your own, and if you're going to try to enter heaven on the basis of doing good things, that's what you have to do. 
By the way, that's not anything wrong with possessions. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a job because you wouldn't have anything to give. You wouldn't have a job. You, you wouldn't have anything to give to anybody. It's not antithetical to have riches, but it's a terrible sin when they have you. But Jesus loves him. And he says, the one thing you need to do, because it's the one thing that's really a problem, because he has an idol in his life. That's why Jesus never mentioned, he shall not make a graven image and bow down to it, because that's what he's doing, because his stuff is way more important than God. His stuff is more important than spending eternity with the Lord. And there it is. So Jesus doesn't get mad. This man only shows partial understanding of who Jesus is and the requirement for salvation. He doesn't understand. But you and I reading through it can understand it. So back to the guy who's praying before God and boasting of himself and the humble guy. Jesus is, I believe, telling us these extended things and showing us these things for those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. I don't know about you, but I have to check my heart very often to make sure that I don't look down on people. There are a lot of people who have done horrible, terrible things, and they are reaping the benefits of all their bad choices. You may be bearing that yourself, or you may know people like that. Do you look down and despise them? You know, they're the ones that have to live with it, not you. Why not compassion? Jesus looked at this guy, and he loved him, and he told him something he couldn't handle. When Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack this one thing. And the guy walks away. When Jesus saw this, I bet he was sad because this guy walks away and he can't be a follower of Jesus and he knows it. And all he has to go back to is, is money, which is a hollow consolation for not being right with God. And then Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful. He said, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, well, then who can be saved? But he said, these things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And Peter said, well, see, we've left all and followed you. Peter wanted to make sure he got in there and got some recognition. <laughs> so he said to them, assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age, uh, the age to come or in eternal life. Now, there's a popular story that's out there that the eye of the needle is a little hole in the wall, in the wall of Jerusalem, that an, a camel could get through, but he had to get on his knees and he had to take off everything that was on his back. And I say, wow, that's pretty cool. Until you go looking for the eye of the needle and it doesn't exist. It's a clever story that somebody made up that seems to work very, very well, but it's not true. I just thought I'd let you know end on a low note. Jesus tells us to be humble, which means I know I'm a sinner. I know I need a savior. I am not going to enter into heaven unless I'm perfect, but Jesus is. And it, Jesus isn't an ingredient that gets added to your life. He either is your life or he's not your life. Right. Jesus wants all or nothing, like the rich young ruler who walked away. Mm -hmm.